This is our teaching a pronunciation interest group event. And we usually have three of us here. There's me, Marcia Chan, uh, my co-coordinator, Randy Reitmeyer, and our assistant coordinator, Patrick Mrozek. So those are the three of us. And why are we here today? We are here today for the, the presentation by Marika van der Meer from the Netherlands. And Yay. It's about whether or not to stress to stress or not to stress. And she's gonna tell about her experience coaching Chinese students, PhD students, right? Mm -hmm. On stress, on word stress in English. As you know, in Katisa, we have a great number of benefits as a member. And we, we like to remind you that uh, if you are a member, you'll really be a member of our very vibrant community in California. Not only do we have student, uh, students and teachers from California, but we have many members from outside of California as well. We have a peer reviewed language publication, which is the Katisa Journal. And it's available online to anybody who wishes to look at the recent research and the implementation of all kinds of uh, methods for teaching English language. We have our monthly Katisa update announcements. When we have conferences and other kinds of events, we have discounts for our members. We have free access to an unlimited number of interest groups, levels, and chapters. And we have a lot of opportunity for us to interact, to network, to learn, to teach with other members of the Katisal community, both at conferences, which as you know, we're going back to live in-person face-to-face conference in Pasadena pretty soon, just this fall, which is really exciting after a couple of years of uh, pandemic remote learning and teaching. We have a chance to do online discussions with like-minded professionals on our message boards. You can also access the job bank if you're looking for a job or if you have a job to offer. And we have access to our recorded webinar. So we know that we often do our webinars live and in person like you guys are here, but many of the webinars are recorded. Now for top interest group, we record all of them. And for the other interest groups and levels, well, some of them are recorded, but whatever we have, we make available to you on our online training webpage in our katisal.org website. We also offer a lot of money, that is awards for grants and teachers and students for professional development. For example, at our upcoming conference, we've been able to gift to quite a number of graduate students, that is our future teachers, to attend the conference in Pasadena. And in just a moment, we're going to hear from our presenter, Ms. Marika van der Meer. So I'm going to now turn it over to our speaker. So I will stop sharing here. And now it's your turn, Marika. Well, thank you very much, Marsha. Now, I'm also using a computer that I not normally use. So um, for me, this is also improvising a little bit uh, with this presenter mode thing. So I'm really sorry about this. Uh, let's see uh, what we can do. So, so like I said, today's uh, topic, or like Marcia said, is coaching Chinese students on word stress. Well, first of all, I'd like to give you a little bit of my context, my journey as a teacher. Uh, into becoming a, a pronunciation coach. And then also let's hear from you, what would you like to take away from today's session? And basically today's topic is about Chinese students and word stress. Why is it important? What are typical word stress issues? And uh, why are they so challenging? So that's the first part. And the second part of the uh, presentation or workshop because I'll try and make it as interactive as possible, is addressing these issues and what methods and materials do I use and what are the results of those techniques. Then finally, a Q&A session and, of course, what's next. And Marcia already told you a little bit about the Pasadena conference. Maybe she has more to say. Uh, we shall hear. And also what's next uh, for me and maybe for you. All right. So let's continue my context, uh, uh, my journey. Well, um, 
I was um, a great fan of my teachers when I was a young girl and they were all very motivating. And I even drew a picture of my English teacher when I was 12 years old. And that is to show actually that uh, she, I really loved her. She was very good. And you can see here in the picture with this pink circle. And here is my male teacher who was also motivating me to go and study English, which I did at the Radboud University here in the ne Netherlands. I did my MA in English and applied linguistics. That was in 1988 when I graduated, long, long time ago. Now, this is an overview of my journey as a teacher. I'll give you some time to see it. And I went from being a teacher into being a trainer and then a coach. Try to read it bottom up. Uh, hi, your journey into specificity on pronunciation. That's right. And English, yes. Uh -huh. Good. Now, my tutors, uh, in, when it comes to pronunciation, is first of all, Adrian Underhill, I suppose most of you know him. He wrote this lovely book, uh, Pronunciation, no, Sound Foundations. And in 2017, uh, I met Piers Messam and Rosalind Young, who have uh, founded the Pronsai uh, company. They uh, work uh, following the articulatory approach, also doing silent way teaching. And uh, um, Alison McGregor, who is now at Princeton University, who's also been my tutor and is also a very good friend. Uh, there are more people I learn from, and because I try to join uh, webinars and, and, and uh, workshops as much as I can, for instance, John Levis, but also Sue Sullivan. Marsha, you've been a great inspiration. Did I thank you for asking me to do this presentation? Have I already? I don't think I did, but thank you very much. Great to have you. Okay, when I was uh, in 2017, uh, I was going to Cambridge joining PRONSIG, which is the special interest group for IATEFL. And uh, I did a presentation in 2019 about word stress that was in Glasgow. And then Gemma Archer, the organizer of the event, asked me to write two articles about it. And here are the uh, covers of those two magazines, the journal from, uh, from PRONSIG. And I'm really grateful to Gemma to have given me that opportunity. Now, let me see, where do I work? I work at several universities here in the Netherlands. This is Life Sciences, Radboud University, more general, broad university, TUE technical, uh, University of Twente, also technical. That's where I do most of my work. And the university here in Xi'an, uh, that is NPU, the Northwestern Polytechnic. I work as a freelancer. So I'm hired by the university language centers. I've taught and trained around about 300 Chinese students by now, I think since 2017. And since the pandemic hit around about a hundred online. And those are very small groups that people sign up for. And of course, also the one-to-one, -one. it's all something uh, PhDs mainly, Chinese PhDs decide to do. Uh, it's not part of a university program, even though they do get uh, credits for the program they follow. All right, um, here you can see some pictures. My Chinese students are very keen to work on their English. They're also lovely to work with. They have a lot of respect for, for me as a teacher. This person always wanted to carry my bag, uh, for instance, then also had a lot of fun uh, working together. Now, what I experience most of the time, and I'm not sure about you, maybe you can share that in a moment, a lot of students feel they need to bridge a gap. Their knowledge level, their technical uh, level, their academic level is at a certain height, and it's usually quite high because they're very good uh, students, but their English skills are a little bit lower, and sometimes a, a, a really big gap uh, is there. And of course, we want to bridge the gap by raising their level of English and not the other way around. Um, and that's why actually um, this has become my passion to work with Chinese PhDs, make sure they speak English with confidence and ease. And also empower them and make sure they can really express themselves more than they feel they can do now because a lot of them have low self-esteem and don't feel very confident, but they have a lot to say and a lot to contribute. So in the end, what are the results? People enjoy listening to them and really get the message. That was my context. 
And I try to follow the Pelly approach during the, my lessons and also would like to try and do that today and try to think for a moment what Pelly can stand for. Oh, P is for participate. The E is for enjoy. The L is for learn and the I is for implement. So hopefully this approach will, is going to work for you today. And so you can take some things away. And let's have a look at what you would like to take away, where you're based and what you do and what's your experience in view of today's topic. So Marcia, maybe you can make some breakout rooms, maybe two rooms is enough, so we can share some, uh, some of our experiences and, and uh, targets for today. All right, great, great. So we, we broke out into two rooms, and um, I think our interaction was such that it was quite a match for today's session. Some people are interested in how helping Chinese students who stress too many words and they don't always have the same rhythm and stress program. So I think Marika was gonna, is gonna talk about that. And another talked about how in working with Chinese students, um, especially those who are pretty advanced in their speaking abilities, um, that is another attraction. So that's what we talked about in our group. How about in yours? Thank you very much for sharing that, Marcia. Let's uh, continue oh, at all. Being understood. Exactly. So that is uh, intelligibility at the heart of it all, isn't it? Now, um, also, when you think of the students' goals, I would like you to have a look at these. Um, this is what my students wrote down on the board one day. And the percentages on the left, how they feel about their skills at the moment in terms of uh, intelligibility and what they would like them to be. So the percentage is what they want to achieve and also what it would mean to them. So good presentations, uh, expressing yourself everywhere you go, having collaborations, job opportunities, a lot at stake for them. And also because um, the, the words, if you take a look at this uh, pyramid, have a high functional load, uh, especially the content words. And uh, this is a pyramid I show my students uh, uh, all the time. It's something I learned from Adrian Underhill to, to separate pronunciation into three levels, even though the levels are all connected, of course. There are no words without any sounds, without any words, there aren't any sentences. But the content and the message is mainly in the words. There is an arrow to sentences because with intonation, we, of course, do a lot with the message, etc. And on the right, you can see that the syllables and, uh, are, are, of course, at the heart of the words, focusing on accents and reductions. My students really like this pyramid because they now can separate uh, their skills uh, uh, depending on the level. Why is it important as well? Just some examples. There's quite uh, often a lot of confusion. So uh, my, one of my students asked me if I wanted to come to Beijing. And I, I wasn't sure because he said, my city has a lot of constructions errors. So what do you think he meant with errors? Areas. Areas, very good, but quite confusing. Then the second one, uh, they also seem to have unusual hobbies. Uh, I love choking, one said. <laughs> this probably should be. Oh, jogging. Oh, jargon, you see? So you can already see by just these two examples what's going on when it comes to word stress, not just stress, but also realization of the vowels, the, the O instead of the O, and areas, not doing a proper diphthong. We'll get to the, those uh, things in a moment. And the other one that was really uh, worrying me, he said, I like my colleague or Col my colleague. colleagues. Colleagues. Yes, colleagues. Well, this is, I think, an example we often hit upon when we talk to Chinese people and uh, can be quite confusing. So pronunciation clearly is a gateway skill, especially when it comes to word stress and being understood. Um, then the uh, last example of confusion I'd like to share with you is what actually made me write the articles. Um, one student is device, uh, designing a device to capture two more cells. But two, I didn't. Two Sorry? more. Two more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> two more cells. So try to say it like two more cells. And then the whole meaning gets lost and the significance of the whole device gets lost. And I thought that was a real pity because he's contributing to cancer research. And I think it's very relevant. 
Okay, and if only, okay, I already said this. If he had reduced the second syllable in tumor, and if he had stressed the first one more, I would have understood uh, the significance and appreciated it straight away. You can see more of this in my article, and there are also links to classroom videos. Now, what are typical word stress issues? This is just to summarize. Inaccurate word stress, stress on the wrong syllable, stress on the correct syllable, but poor acoustic results. This is what I take from Angel. So not long enough, the, the stressed syllable is not long enough, or it's not loud enough, or it's not high enough. So all the acoustic results uh, actually are not there. Then secondly, a poor reduction of unstressed syllables, like in the word tumor that we just heard. So there is too much reduction. That's also possible in a word like catalyst, where a, 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 a stressed a syllable is just compressed and it's not there anymore. Or there is too little reduction in the word like tumor or computer, where the first syllable is pronounced as computer trying to follow what's being, being spelled. And the third uh, issue is related to word clusters. Uh, inaccurate primary stress across the cluster. What happens if three or four words are together? And also what happens with derivatives when there is, uh, when there is stress shift? So these I I'd like to discuss with you. And uh, we started a little late today, so I hope I can do everything I plan to do with you, but maybe I need to uh, shift a little, uh, skip a few things. I'll just have to play by ear in that respect. Um, this is what students say. It's hard for me to unlearn the wrong stress. This is something to realize for, for, from the student perspective, okay? Secondly, I think I know the right stress, but then it turns out to be wrong. So they guess and it's not the right guess. I mispronounce words if I only inspect their spelling. So tip, um, clearly something going on there. Um, now, why are they so challenging? I also uh, try to explore that uh, a little bit with my students, all the ones that I have been working with. And uh, the first thing maybe uh, quite obvious is little practice. When they go abroad, they've done their reading, they've done their writing probably and, and listening, but not so much the speaking. Then there's a lot of anxiety going on. The cultural aspect is important and their L1 speaking habits. Poor articulation. We already talked about that when it was about choking and jogging. Just that is, to me, a matter of articulation and also realizing the vowels. Then, of course, uh, and I think most people know this, Chinese tone system uh, versus English stress system. I should have written tone system, but it's tones. Never mind. Let's have a look at these in a little bit more detail. So a little practice socializing with Chinese friends. That's basically what happens. Of course, they flock together, so to speak, when they're abroad and uh, don't interact so much. Also because they're anxious, not daring to speak, afraid of losing face. Some students say, I shut down when I need to speak English or feel like clamming up, feel nervous, like this one. Um, so uh, they may tend to rush also part of anxiety, I think. Let's say it quickly, so nobody can um, uh, notice my lack of confidence or my non-standard pronunciation. And people may not be patient with me, so they're putting quite a bit of pressure on themselves. This is all um, general uh, factors that, uh, that influence word stress. Now, the cultural aspect, Speaking softly in Chinese culture in general is associated with being polite, especially towards teachers and elderly people. If I speak softly, people, people won't notice my flaws. That's other, another strategy. Let's not speak too loudly because then people don't hear I speak in a funny way. Thirdly, uh, one student shared with me the Confucian doctrine of the mean. I, I'll try and say it in Chinese, but... Uh, I'd better not try that because I'm not very good at it at the moment. <laughs> but the Chinese proverb, the gun will hit the first bird, relates to it. Don't stand out, else you will die. So there's that whole aspect of not being very expressive, just trying to hide a little bit. 
And Chinese parents also, especially to the girls, say, don't move your face too much. If you're too active while speaking, it's not considered good behavior. All right, these are generalizations. Now let's have a look at cultural aspect and identity. And there was one student who's, I think, hit the nail on the head when he uh, talked to me during my one-to-one -one session with him. Maybe you would like to read this, what he said about his identity. Yeah, can you put your hand up when you've read it, when you've finished it? Okay, thank you. And I tried to say to my uh, students and encourage them to find their English me and make them aware of, of the fact that there is this identity thing going on. Like when you speak Chinese, you probably feel different from speaking English, but still you. I also feel that when I speak Dutch and I speak English, me, but different. Mm, speaking habits. This is a very, very important thing. And you may wonder, why are we not getting on to word stress now? Why do we need to worry about speaking habits? Well, Derving et al. have stressed this in their article. Speaking habits are very important also for intelligibility. And the L1 speaking habit for Chinese people is maybe more like playing badminton. And they will have to get into playing a game of tennis. Very much uh, uh, well, they're both ball games, but different rules, different techniques, different ways of playing it, different feel to it. And then if you think of it all, the tongue, lips, breath, and also abdominal muscles, which are associated with what Catford calls initiator power as a description of stress, these are all at stake. And sometimes I tease my students and say, okay, you have Chinese lips, you have a Chinese tongue. What I'm trying to say is it's you've used it for so long to speak your first language. Now you need to retrain it to be able to speak English better and be better understood. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen the MRI scans that are, have been uh, issued by Berkeley University. Have you seen those with uh, an American tongue and a Chinese tongue? Uh, uh, being scanned and now I, this is a challenge for me. I'm going to run this one. And you try to observe the differences. Yeah. If you stop share and then open up your link and share that, we should be able to see it. I think uh, the best thing now is to actually skip it. Uh, you can watch that uh, yourself. I, am I back uh, sharing my uh, PowerPoint now? You can watch these in your own time. I'll try to describe them very briefly. Uh, with the English tongue, the American English tongue, moving a lot against the, the uh, teeth ridge, very, very active, like a little hammer. And the Chinese tongue, if this is the Chinese tongue, moving up and down more towards the back of the mouth and also less lip movement and uh, typically less tongue movement. So that's already a huge difference, something they really need to work on to say, okay, I need to have my English speaking habits in place. And this also has to do with volume, speech rate, and stream of speech. So how do you speak? Do you speak nonstop? Some Chinese students do that, but also because they want to hide maybe some of their flaws and they keep going, 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 going. They speak softly and then keep going, going, going. And not so fluent with their stream of speech in terms of uh, speaking in chunks. So basically what I tell my students is three strategies to follow. And these are strategies they can easily remember. Speak up, speak slowly, and speak in chunks. Well, why are they relevant to word stress? Well, also because acoustic results of uh, louder, longer, and uh, higher uh, syllables are related to volume. And also to speaking more slowly, where you can really focus on the articulation of the... Um, of the sounds. And it's all about proprioception, isn't it? Getting set for that new language that you're learning. Poor articulation, here are some examples and I think you're, some of you will already be familiar with them. No difference between long and short vowels, cheek and chick. The double vowels are not realized with a full 
double vowel. So skill and scale sound sort of the same. Wafer is not an A, but a wafer. Requirements, requirements, requirements. So more like an S sound and wide, also the I sound, not opening the jaw very uh, clearly. The errors areas, we already focused on that one. Try to think of the word materials. Which syllable do you think is going to be a trouble? Maybe stress the first syllable, material. Sometimes they're not sure what to do exactly. Yes, that's right. And think of double vowels. Materials. Yes, exactly. So the last syllable is not pronounced eels, not a, a double sound. Thank you. The consonants, uh, quite a bit of trouble also uh, with L and R and N at the end of a word or a V at the end, causing a lot of uh, intelligibility issues. So uh, quite related to the topic of word stress. Think of this word, range, where the N mm is very difficult to realize sometimes. Consonant clusters, like in the word colleague, we already found that. Leagues performance, having to say that NC. And also I thought that would be relevant and I'm going to play you some audios. Uh, grammar markers are involved. If you think of past tense, and if you think of the plural, if, if, if um, students don't pronounce those clearly, then it may also cause confusion. So think of uh, verb inflections like he show, should have been he shows, it reach, it reaches, quite a challenge, but also past tense participle after T and D, forwarded and deposited. Now I'm getting into my next uh, challenge. Here is uh, the jizz I was talking about, the plural. Um, all right, before we go to the audio, and I hope I can play the audio to you, uh, technically speaking, uh, this is a sound chart I use from Pronsai, from Piers Messam and uh, Rosalind Young. So I really do a lot of sound work with my students also to make sure they can uh, realize word stress uh, in a good way. So at the top, you can see the vowels. At the bottom, below the second white horiz uh, horizontal white line, you can see the schwa family as um, Adrian Underhill calls it, the schwi, the schwa and the schwu. So he gives them uh, those names. So the high energy uh, vowels, get the stress or they get the full sound, but maybe not be accented. And of course the ones at the bottom, low energy. And I think that visual support of high and low energy is going to help our students. Now here are the audios and I hope- uh, Our model identified sunlight and the shade leaves when we calculate evapotranspiration. Okay, did you hear that one? Is it audible? Marcia, yeah. did you hear it? Would yeah. you like to hear it one more time? Yeah. Okay, what I'd like you to focus on, this is about uh, the past tense marker, right? So see if you can spot where she's leaving them out. Uh, our model identified the sunlight and the shaded leaves when we calculated evapotranspiration. Oh, that is the second take. Did you hear uh, the difference? Our model identified the sunlight and the shaded leaves when we calculated evapotranspiration. I am a PhD candidate at UT. My topic is about. Okay. Did you hear the difference between the first take and the second one? Mm, I didn't. I didn't hear the difference. I thought they sounded okay. the same. Okay, try to listen to the first one and see if you can hear where she leaves out the past tense, like shaded. And uh, okay, let's try that. All right. Uh, our model identified sunlight and the shade leaves when we calculate evapotranspiration. She should have said calculated, right? Okay, let's hear the second one after we had worked on it. Uh, our model identified the sunlight and the shaded leaves when we calculated evapotranspiration. Did you hear it? Did you hear the difference now? Yeah. Okay, let's go to Yang. She was uh, is also a Chinese student and she's uh, doing some research. 
And what she didn't do is really pronounce the plural uh, cis at, at the end of her one of her keywords and see if you can spot that. Cra. Sorry, I'll go back to the beginning. Yeah. My name is Yang Meng. I am a PhD candidate at UT. My topic is about graph theory. Our work is to find specific classes of graphs in any graph with vertices now less than a given number. Did you hear the word I was trying to focus on? I, I didn't. <laughs> it's difficult maybe when you just hear it for hear it once. She, she should have said vertices, so the plural of vertex. But she just missed that C's at the end. Oh, okay. Well, if you want, you can, Marsha's going to send you uh, the PowerPoint and uh, the video so you can listen again. Um, and the next video is the tone system. I'm not sure if you... Sorry? I'm just Marcia. trying to say, for me, my transmission is not my misbehavior here over here. So I'm not hearing clearly what you're trying to uh, play for us. But maybe oh. if I get, um, get my computer cleaned up, it will be better. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Let's listen to the tone Me system. Too. It's OK. Uh, let's listen to uh, the tone system. And one of my students, uh, uh, can you put your hand up if you don't know anything about the difference? OK, so you all know the differences, don't you? Yeah. Can you put your hand up if you think, yes, I already know this? Yes, you know it. OK, Shannon. OK, then maybe we could. This is a lovely video, but let's skip it then. There's also uh, the difference. OK, so today is the 12th of so June. Today I, no. OK. Uh, this is the. Uh, the tone system summarized. This was the MRI text. Welcome to the Max Planck Science Gallery, where you can see all the tones and also you can see the, the, the single syllable words. So it's all monosyllabic and they have different tones that uh, are not similar to the, to the stresses we have. Okay, um, yes. What also happens is something that Marsha already tried to mimic and that is, uh, the tone that doesn't have enough profile, so the energy profile being actually too, too, um, too much in the same range. Now, let me see if I can get this working for you. I'm Hong Zhao. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Tant. My project is microwave remote sensing of vegetation for agriculture monitoring. My work is I'm Hong Zhao. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Tant. My project is microwave remote sensing of vegetation for agriculture monitoring. My work is to develop a multi-frequency simulator to synthesize data from future microwave missions. All right. I would say her articulation is quite good. We can all understand what she's saying, but it's all in this flat tone, isn't it? Now we try to work on that. Uh, this is what is the result. I'm Hong Zhao. I'm a postdoc researcher at UT. My project is microwave remote sensing of vegetation for agriculture monitoring. My work is to develop a multi-frequency simulator to synthesize data from future microwave missions. Okay, she's still having trouble with synthesize, but that was something to still work on. What sort of difference did you notice? You worked on her stress and you had her stress the main from both and she was actually going a little bit higher on her. She's moving out of the monotone. In yes, that's right. So give us so what that word is supposed to be. Right, any more responses? I feel like I, I noticed how tired I felt listening to her because yeah. just being empathetic of how much energy it takes to stress 
every syllable, um, I felt much more relaxed the second time because she didn't have to work so hard <laughs> to yeah. enunciate. I, I see what you mean. And I think that's, uh, I also used to work as a Cambridge examiner and one of the criteria we had to apply listening to people's pronunciation was, does it put a strain on me as a listener? And I think the first one definitely puts a strain on us. And the second one, you can just take it all in and it seems to be fairly easy. Thank you very much for saying that. Okay, let's continue. So we've now uh, reached stage two, um, the importance of word stress, typical word stress issues, why are they so challenging? Any thoughts you would like to share on this? Yeah, to stress every syllable, because if you stress every syllable, it sounds like you're running, throwing stones at somebody. Mm -hmm. As, as uh, Shannon mentioned, it's very tiring for the listener. Uh, That's right. To be able to uh, capture the meaning of it. You're spending so much time trying to figure out, okay, where the clumps of syllables belong to word, uh, to words, to chunks, and... Um, that's why I thank you very much for saying that's what that's why I insist from the beginning to try and speak in chunks, uh, because within the chunk is your realization of that profile, isn't it? Thank you very much. So let's continue. Uh, so what methods, materials uh, have I used to to tackle these issues, to address them? And what are the results? OK. Um, these were the uh, uh, the issues just to. Have a glance at them again. I will tackle one and two and then three separately. I'm now giving an overview of, of my uh, strategies. All right, so first one, break the L1 transfer cycle. This is an ongoing thing. But of course, in the beginning, we need to break through this a little harder. The more they do it, uh, the more they speak English, the better it will go. But some people never... Uh, change and I think that's why we need to try and sort of break through it in an in a gentle and nice way so that they will change their habits and uh, if you've brought your pen did you bring a pen along like I like I asked you I would like you to do two things and one is uh, write your name with your dominant hand can you write your name with your dominant hand on a piece of paper And when you've done that, take your pen in the other hand and try to write your name like that. And try to see what, try to notice what happens. This is a little bit like going from badminton to tennis, but anything you notice? Very awkward for me. I'm not, yes. um, so for me, it just feels like so foreign. And mm -hmm energy to just yeah. form something that looks terrible yeah so you also have an opinion of of what you're doing mm, i do terrible results okay um this is something we need to realize with our students for them it's a, it's a really uh, something new they're going to learn and they're also going to maybe try and uh, speak English the way they've always spoken Chinese with their Chinese framework here in their uh, faces and mouths. And if you take a look, I often show them uh, my uh, these visuals with the muscles here all connected. And here from the side view to just make them realize this is all connected. Uh, sensitize them to stress timing. We ha I have some very nice exercises for, the, for that. Then just simply syllabify how many syllables in a word, categorize the syllables and try to internalize the energy profiles that, uh, that emerge uh, with different uh, syllables. Okay, let's go to the transfer cycle. We have the speech breathing. This is something I learned from Roslyn and Pierce where we activate the abdominal muscles and the diaphragm to really activate uh, speaking. Because when you speak your first language, everything is automatic. Your, your muscles don't, don't do anything. They do something, but you've trained them to do it. So um, I use this poem by David McCord to practice speech breathing. And this is the kind of speech breathing. This is the way we speak. So maybe you can try that, putting your hands on your stomach here. 
and maybe if you stand, you can try it even, even better and say, okay, speech, breathing, bananas and cream, bananas and cream. All we could say was bananas and cream. Would you like to try that? Bananas and cream, bananas and cream. All we could say was bananas and cream. This is uh, He Ping, and he's going to, uh, to show you how he does it. And this was a man who was very, very shy, very softly spoken, very much like the mouse that I have here. He just hardly dared speak out and speak up. Here we go. So today is the 19th of February. We're here in the House of Hay now to do some English lessons. And it's uh, He Ping uh, doing his uh, pronunciation practice with bananas and cream, activating the muscles. Yeah. Okay. Make it a bit louder, yeah. Banana cream, banana cream. All we could say was banana cream. Very good. And see, that was the cat. See if you can go to the lion, like a loud voice, but still pulling the muscles, yeah? Banana cream, banana cream. All we could say was banana cream. <laughs> Great work by uh, Hupping, who is now getting control over, also over his volume and over his way of breathing and speaking. So the second part uh, for breaking through the Elbon cycle is also uh, working on volume. And let's see how he does that. And he, he, he does it step by step physically. So this is more related to, uh, to your way of uh, teaching pronunciation, Donna, the haptic integrated approach. And uh, let's just see how he does that. And he goes, like I showed you just now, I take the mouse with me, the cat, these are all hand puppets, and the lion to make sure they really activate themselves. Softly, the mouse, cat, lion. Shall we try? Okay, this is the 19th of February, lesson one. We're practicing uh, bananas and cream and also speaking softly, then a bit more loud, and then uh, maximum uh, loudness. Okay, off you go. Okay. Very good, okay, go back please. And don't remember, forget to say was, all we could say was bananas and cream. Yeah, now the cats, a little bit louder. Okay, I think you're you're getting that. Uh, let's no, I... continue. Slowing down, very important, and we can integrate that with our mouth yoga. And this was uh, inspired by you, Marsha, and by uh, uh, Fumiko Takatsu from Japan uh, to stretch the muscles and really activate the whole apparatus here. So let's try and go into that if you'd like to join. Uh, this is all uh, warming up uh, for, uh, for the word stress, isn't it? And when my students do it, they feel more relaxed. They say they speak more easily and can speak louder afterwards. So that's good, isn't it? Shall we try? So stretching, and I use my uh, lion for that. Let's go for wow. Okay, we do a small, medium, large. Here we go. Three, two, one. Wow. Wow. And maximum, wow. Okay, let's do it. And we keep, on the maximum, we keep 10 seconds, okay? We stay there. Three, two, one. Wow. Wow. And maximum, wow. Very good. And massage the jaw. Wow. Wow. And we can make the oh sound. So I also try to have my mouth yoga uh, with the sound chart and say, let's do that e. Let's do that oh. Okay. And let's do the ooh. Then for the tongue, rolling the tongue is very important. Let's do five rolls, clockwise, five rolls, anti clockwise. Here we go.
Good. <clears throat> then there's the total body exercising, and it's very much related that to that Zhao Chao uh, in China. This is the morning exercise that um, students do at school before they go to school. So that's basically moving the body and also activating uh, the students and their energy levels. I'm not going to do it now because I also want to go to the uh, more specified exercises, but I think this is something we can't do enough, especially when we work online. So maybe you'd like to do like Marcia's doing, activate yourself. There's also some music that I always use with my students. Okay. And notice the difference. I, I think it's in, so invigorating and uh, energizing. Right. This is what their students say. So refreshing after a long time sitting and it gets me in a good mood. All right. Speak with more energy. We already practiced that. Uh, yep. Then the stress timing. Um, just to get a feel for that. This is an exercise by, from Adrian Underhill. It's the me, you, him, her. And then you add a little word, me and you and him and her. So of course they need to uh, speed up the words that are in between. And this is what this could sound like. And uh, three, two, one. Me, you, him, her. Me, you, him, her. Me, you, him, and 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 her. So we did this as a, as, a, as a routine, every class we started with this and the students got more and more fluent and you could also hear that some of them were there and some of the, them were really still working on getting the stress timing right. Yes, and the stress timing is also ideal with bananas and cream because it has that beat, doesn't it? Bananas and cream, bananas and cream. So that's this uh, sensitization uh, process. Now, syllabifying can be done very easily and in a very haptic way, just by uh, the way that these students so do. So here's a short video on how to start with word stress. And the first step is counting the syllables. So let's go for the word supervisor, yeah? Can you do that? Can you do a bit of counting? So how many? Four. <laughs> of course, there was four, not too difficult. But you could see what they were doing. And I can also see very easily whether they get it right, because I can see the hands moving and they can internalize um, more syllabification. Maybe you can try for yourself, if you see these words, how you would do it. I'm not sure about you, but I, I get in a good mood when I do this. It seems to work uh, very well. It makes me smile. What about you? Can you open your mics and say something? Just doing it is fun, isn't it? It's nice to move and just kind of... Yes, it is, isn't it? Break the monotony, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay. Now, um, uh, something that's uh, for, for syllabification also try to separate the syllables visually like they're done in the dictionary, okay? We may think, oh, well, this is obvious, but for the students, it can be very helpful. For instance, the word colleague is often considered to be three syllables, whereas it's only two. And then a third technique for syllabification is writing a haiku. I'm not sure if you know about haikus, but they have five syllables, seven syllables, and then five. So there's no messing about with haikus because it has to be right. Okay, five, seven, five. And these are haikus that uh, Shan wrote. Uh, I think she missed one syllable, to be honest, but see if you can, uh, can enjoy those. In Marinka's class, we share and tap together. It's really fun. Blue sky and white cloud. The weather in Netherlands. How lovely it is. 
She's doing a very nice job with uh, stressing the syllables, isn't she? Okay, so that's writing a haiku. Uh, we're not going to do the haiku writing now, but this is something I would like to invite you to do with your class as soon as you get back to them after the summer break, because it's so lovely to write some poetry and create this atmosphere of what you want to express with your haiku. And it's very In effective. And now for categorizing the syllables, this is where the color coding comes in. Take a look. This is the board that I have here behind me where I did some color coding with the students. Now, please have a look at the picture and see if you can figure out what the colors mean. And if you think you do, then uh, you can uh, open up your mics. So these are magnets uh, on the board, but I can also use um, stack cubes like these for t uh, today, or I can do teacher, all right? Or if I want, I can do the optics. I have my color coding. Yes, you have your cards with you. Okay, lovely. So see if you can do one of the words with your cards. Here is the optics. And then what's also good about this system is actually um, there's a, a limited number of colors that we have. So just three colors I need to remember, reduced syllable, the high energy one and medium. So I can now also visually support that by the size of the cards and by the color. So that is taking it from the auditory to the visual and the haptic. Okay, and I also um, take quite a bit of time to share this with my students and say, okay, look, how many syllables do we have? And I share this with them. And give an example like evaluation. Also, what's in the dictionary? There's sub accent, evaluation is there. And the full and unstressed syllable is the red one. And I think it doesn't get enough attention in pronunciation teaching because we always focus on the main accents, the green one. But the full one is also important for substress, isn't it? Evaluation. With people who are, have, have a more sophisticated vocabulary, yes. <laughs> Yay. For students who are more at the beginning or intermediate level, we are just happy if they can get of course, of course. But sometimes, for instance, if, if it's about a, a plural ending like vertices, we will have to use the red syllable because that's the plural marker, you see? So that's why it comes in uh, very handy. Take a look at these. This is a different uh, overview where I have given them four options for syllables. Full and accented, the green syllable, full but unaccented, the red syllable, reduced white, but also compressed syllable in the word um, business, for instance, or colleague. Yeah, that's not really a compressed syllable because Lee, the G-U-E is not giving a full syllable, but a, a word like business is a good example, for instance. And just um, call a spade a spade, be very specific and explicit about the syllable system. All right. Now let's go over to you. Uh, yes, also the sound chart comes in very handy, like I already said. Now see if you can categorize the syllables and do a bit of color coding for yourself. So choose one of the words and see if you can color code it. All right. When you've color coded it with your cards, can you share it? Which word am I doing out of these six? Measure. Measure, very good. And this one is? Colleagues. Good, you're getting it. Wonderful. So here's your color coding. We also, of course, focus on the accent mark that like they find in the dictionary, the dots in between the syllables, then more options for validation, for instance, validation or validation. 
And the word stress patterns have the energy profile that we want our students to get comfortable with. So if we talk about energy, that's something they can relate to, like with batteries, you know, um, what's the energy level? And the full and accent, unaccented vowel is something I got from uh, Piers Messam, uh, the way he described it in his article in 2014. Now you can see, and I'm trying to zoom in now, this is a worksheet that my students work on with the color coding. Uh, let me see if I can make it any bigger. Okay, what it does, uh, and you can see that when you get the PowerPoint, is they really color code with their colored pen, they color code the keywords and also come up with their own keywords, like computer science or population genetics, you know, those words, and where are the stresses? And they really seem to enjoy that. And it also it shows to me whether they really master the stress uh, patterns. And then for internalizing and categorizing syllables, let's have a look at the um, uh, haptic approach. And we try to do it uh, something that most of you may be familiar with, with standing up, sitting down, but also the red syllable is there and see what movement they make for the red syllable. Supervise it, let's color code it. Very difficult word for a lot of students. They want to say supervisor, or they want to compress the second syllable and say supervisor. So we get to the supervisor. Did you get it the way I got it? All right. We don't have enough hands. That's right. <laughs> That's why we have the, um, the stand. All right, let's see what they are going to do. Okay, so let's hear the word supervisor from you. Okay, on the count of three, and then show me the body gestures, right? Three, two, one. Supervisor. Good, one more time. And stress the su, make that a, a sound longer, louder, and uh, higher in pitch, okay? Three, two, one. Supervisor. Very good. And the same goes for this video where we have the color coding in the hand and we try to figure out the word supervisor. Well, you can see that in your own time. Maybe they, um, these are the Cuisinaire rods that are used for silent way teaching. All right, it's the same thing. Now let's take a look at the time. I'm going to skip through some. Okay, we've already had this. And stand up, stretch the arms and sit down is the... Uh, so let's try and do that for validation. Okay, shall we do that together? Three, two, one, validation. Okay, shall we try? Three, two, one, validation. Graduation. And if you think this may be too much for your students uh, in the beginning, you can also use the palm of your hand, which is done also by Karen Taylor, the caballero. She just does, does the palm for the, for, the, for the stress, right? Performance, pronunciation. All right. Now let's uh, continue the reduction. That's an important element. I think uh, if you think of too much reduction, uh, then... Uh, we can do some back chaining. I'm not sure if you're familiar with back chaining. And that is actually saying syllables, uh, but without any meaning. So if you'd like to go after me, uh, then uh, try to follow, okay? Two. Two. Good. To two. To two. To two. To two. Good. Quarter to two. Quarter to two. Good. It's a quarter to two. It's a quarter to two. Good. So this is actually something that can help students produce a reduced syllable uh, that they're not so uh, familiar with, like the word catalyst. They will say catalyst and skip the whole syllable. All right. But the kata is important, even though it is reduced. And this uh, is a way of training them to, to do that. It's a quarter to two. And the computer word may be uh, reduced too little. So the computer, and very often my students say, Marika, this is in the spelling. I need to say com because it is spelled computer. But it's not actually, of course, what it should be, computer. 
where we have an open transition. But I would like to finish uh, with this video because this is Peng and he's working on this word tumor that we started with. Mm -hmm. And this is to show what a reduction feels like to a Chinese student, all right? This is your topic then, Peng. Capture two more cells. Okay, are we happy? Mm. Some people go, mm. which word does he need to change? Wow. Okay, more, more energy on Chu. Yeah. Go again. Capture two more cells. Okay, what should he reduce more? Oh. The more, yeah. Okay, forget about more, just make it a, a reduced sound. Sorry? The more of two more, Yeah. it's too much energy. Okay. But the rest was very good. Keep mm -hmm. the rest and reduce that. Yeah. Try again. Capture two more cells. But even reduce more. Two more. That's it. Really? Really. Two more. Okay. So weak. <laughs> so weak. Okay. Yeah. That's a great moment, I thought, when he's really saying so weak, like I can't believe it. And that's what he needs to get used to, right? And he's uh, doing a great job finishing it. Yeah, please. Capture two more cells. Okay. And then more energy on two and not so much energy on cells. Ta da da. Capture. Two more cells. That's good. One more time. Capture two more cells. Okay, and then reduce the m even more. Two more. Yeah, that's it. Two more. Two. Okay. And don't forget the. Capture two more cells. Wow. One more time. Capture two more cells. This is wow. your topic then, Punk. I think we now recognize the word tumor cells much more than in the beginning when he was going two more cells. Okay, let me go to the final slide, and that is, um, um, there's the keyword derivative. Do we have time for one more video, Marsha, a short one? No, uh, we don't, because we have another event. That's right. Okay, okay. this is for the Sorry. keyword derivatives and the keyword, um, the contour lines that we uh, can use, okay? And some videos by the students, the results, takeaways, any questions, what's next? Okay, you can get my uh, pro poster presentation, articles if you like, and the uh, references for Levis and Brinton I will uh, put in the PowerPoint. This is my email address, maybe we can finish off with this slide. If you would like to mail me, would, would get in touch with me, would like to know more about the things that we didn't have time for today, please contact me. I'm very happy to, uh, to be in touch with you and uh, talk about things and hear from you, Thank what you you've taken away. Very, very nice presentation. And of course you had so much to say and we were not, uh, our, our computers were not really pleasantly aligned with our desires this early mm -hmm. morning. Uh, we did what we can and that's what we have found when we were doing a remote presentation that we have. That's right. But you did very well, and I thank you very much for sharing what you have with our, our group here, both the ones who are present with us at this moment and those who will be watching later on. So very, very uh, glad to have you here.